My name is Katie Salzman, and I am the lead archivist for the Southwestern Writers Collection here at the Whitliff. But today I get to wear another hat as co-curator, along with Alan Schaefer, of this homegrown poster exhibition. Alan, who's taking his seat now, <laughs> um, is on faculty in the English department at Texas State and is also the editor of, I think you've all seen this by now, but the beautiful <laughs> accompanying catalog <laughs> published by the University of Texas Press as a part of the Whitliff series with them. It really is my pleasure to welcome you all here this afternoon, as well as to introduce a number of folks who are here and without whom we would not have the collections, this exhibition, or the book. I'd like to start with our founding donors, Bill and Sally Whitliff. Right here. Bill and Sally founded what is now the Whitliff Collections nearly 30 years ago in 1986 to preserve this region's creative legacy and to instruct and inspire the current generations as well as those to come. We have the daily pleasure, pleasure here at the Whitliff of working to fulfill their vision and to build upon it. Texas State University has generously supported this effort and we are honored to have President Denise Trouth and her husband, John, Dr. John Huffman, here today. <laughs> also joining us is Associate Vice President and University Librarian, Joan Heath. <laughs> we are so fortunate to have a university administration who not only get what we do, but who support it so fully. How many of you, I'm going to ask this question, how many of you, this is your first time to the Whitliff Collections? Wow. Well, I won't go into the whole spiel, but thank you and welcome. <laughs> wow. So for those, of us, for those of you who have been to the Whitliff before, you're probably seeing something a little different than the fine art photography normally in this gallery. But the idea is no different. It's storytelling. Whether it is through writing, photography, music, film, or art, storytelling is at the heart of the Whitliff Collections. And these posters have an important story to tell about a unique time, not only in Austin, but in American culture. This exhibition really began with one person, and that is Tom Wilmore. In 2004, Tom gifted nearly 300 posters, handbills, and flyers to the Whitliff. His collection really provides an astonishing reflection of what was going on in Austin music and culture during this time period. So we want to thank you, Tom, for entrusting your collection to us. While the majority of the posters in Homegrown are from Tom's collection, others have generously donated posters and cultural ephemera to the Whitliff before and since. The papers of Joe Nick Potosky include a number of posters and handbills, some of which are in this exhibition. Nancy Copeland has donated posters to the Whitliff, and a number of posters came to us through the estate of Jody Fisher, who was an assistant to Willie Nelson for many years. So thank you to those donors. In addition, if you've had a chance to see, there's a case in the back gallery. We're featuring a selection of original artwork created by many of the poster artists for Oat Willies in Austin. And, uh, and Doug Brown generously donated his Oat Willies artwork collection to us in 2008. I don't know if Doug is here. So once Alan and I set about narrowing down our selections for the exhibit, we realized that there were a few, really only a few, um, key pieces that we felt we needed to include in order to tell the full story. Several artists and others, um, namely Danny Garrett, Houston White, Carry On, Sam Yates, Michael Knott, Nels Jacobson, and Jesse Sublett all opened up their personal archives for us, allowing us to acquire these works. And <laughs> Thank you. 
And, and Michael Priest and Bobby Earl Smith each loaned us an important work for the exhibit and catalog, also on the walls here. Hey, One of the first things Alan and I did when we embarked on this project was to visit with Leah Meckling at the South Austin Popular Culture Center, where they exhibit and celebrate Austin's unique cultural history year round. Leah was instrumental in helping us contact a number of the artists and photographers represented in the show. So thank you to Leah. Yeah. We wanted to reach out to some of these folks and invite them to campus to talk about their work. Um, when I went to pick up Tom's collection in 2004, um, he and I sat down in his dining room so I could inventory the posters and we quickly, very quickly, <laughs> got sidetracked by Tom's stories about each one as we pulled them out of his trunk. <laughs> it was clear from the beginning that one of the enduring aspects about the posters was not just the physical items themselves, but the memories that they evoked. Alan and I wanted to capture some of that with this project and we knew that interviewing the artists would be imperative. So it is no coincidence that the artists on today's panel are ones who generously gave of their time to meet with us and share their stories. And Alan is going to introduce them, but I'd just like to quickly thank Carrie, Jim, Michael, and especially Danny, who visited with us several times, we kept calling him back, <laughs> uh, for their support of this project. And really, really, everyone who we reached out to, artists, club owners, musicians, have been incredibly welcoming. And that responsive was, responsiveness, as well as this truly amazing turnout for today's event, give testament to the spirit of community that surrounds these posters and the times that they represent. That spirit of collaboration is reflected here at Texas State. We first learned of Tom and his collection through Gary Hartman and the folks at the Center for Texas Music History. Then last semester, Texas State graduate students in the public history program, Kelly Shapiro and Todd Richardson, um, who are here today, designed a companion online exhibition that will be launched very soon. And Mary Michael Stump and Grayson Lawrence in the Department of Art and Design shared an app that they've created called Musing so that we could install an audio component to this exhibit and incorporate some of the great stories the artists had shared with us. Alan and I had a lot of fun selecting and arranging the exhibition, but we also had a lot of support along the way. Carla Ellard, who's our photo photography curator at the Whitliff, was really the first to recognize the potential size of this exhibition, and she graciously ceded this beautiful gallery space <laughs> for the project. She also steered us through the process of mounting an exhibit of this scope, and we really would have been lost without her. It was Whitliff Collections director, David Coleman, who recognized the potential for the corresponding catalog, and Steve Davis, literary curator for the Whitliff, who helped to navigate the publication of the book. John Scott framed all the works, Doug Mortensen installed the show, and the guys at Accent Lighting Designs provided the lighting. Our own very talented Michelle Miller designed the panel text as well as the lovely invitation and takeaway card. But really, the heart and soul of this exhibition are the posters and the poster artists who created them. There are 30 artists represented in the exhibition, and at last count, I believe at, last, at least half of them are here with us this afternoon. Um, as you look around, they should be wearing name tags that will identify them as such, but I wonder if I could ask the artists who are here to please stand. And sadly, sadly, some artists have passed away, but we are so honored to have their family members and friends with us. And of course, we will always have their incredible work to remember them by. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce Alan Schaefer, co-curator of the exhibition and editor of the catalog. Alan, as I mentioned, teaches in the English department here at Texas State, and I can think of nobody who I would have rather worked with on this project. Not only is Alan a talented writer, but he is a musician in his own right, and an all-around stand-up guy. This project has been over two years in the making, and Alan has been steadfast in seeing it through. I truly admire his perseverance, his integrity, and the wealth of knowledge that he has contributed throughout the process. So I give you Alan Schaefer.
afternoon. Well, I'm going to immediately return the thank you to Katie when she called me in the fall of 2012 and said, do you want to work on an Austin music poster exhibition and project? My jaw hit the floor and I said, of course, just let me know what to do. So um, I can't thank Katie enough for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to do this. And we've had such an incredible time working on this together. So thank you, Katie. Um, I'll introduce our artists and moderator today. We'll start here with Carrie Ahn, uh, originally from Houston. Carrie Ahn, born Fitzgerald, uh, <laughs> cut his teeth on uh, Rick Griffin's comics for Surfer Magazine and Big Daddy Roth's Hot Rod Art. And by elementary school, he was a comic artist in his own right. By high school, he was producing work for the Houston underground paper Space City and Austin's The Rag. Um, in 1969, Carrie saw Jim Franklin's work at the Texas Pop Festival in Louisville, and by 1970, he ventured to Austin to track down Franklin and join the emerging <laughs> gang of artists. I, I, I think you told me that in an interview. From what I understand, you weren't the only artist who came looking for Jim. <laughs> Jesus. Carrie, Carrie produced posters for the Armadillo World Headquarters, but it was his work for the Soap Creek Saloon, which began in late. Yeah. Yeah. Late, late 73, early 1974, uh, Carrie really found his groove at Soap Creek he and many others. Um, <laughs> Kerry, Kerry would produce monthly calendars for the venue for the better part of the decade. He single-handedly created the Soap Creek Saloon visual aesthetic and offered comical and sometimes grotesque renderings of performers, <laughs> scenesters, regulars, and whoever else showed up at the club. And it was at Soap Creek that, that Kerry crossed paths with the Texas groover Doug Somm, who would commission him to create uh, the album art for Psalms 1974, uh, Groover's Paradise, which I believe you said helped uh, you buy your first car. Is that <laughs> uh, in addition to his poster art, which Michael Priest has described as wildly psychedelic. Uh, <laughs> you guys are an easy audience. <laughs> Carrie, has, Carrie has led the Uranium Savages and other related musical <laughs> ventures for over 40 years. Combining comedy, performance art, rock and roll, and country music, Carrie Savages have been a cornerstone in Austin's comedy and music scenes. Uh, and numerous artists and musicians have done their time with the Savages, including uh, Randy Biscuit Turner, whose flyers for his band, The Big Boys, are hanging over here in the gallery. Um, one, of, one of Carrie's more recent works is an eight foot by 60 foot mural hanging in the HEB Central Market in South Austin. He continues to perform, and he is now painting more than ever. Carry on. Hey. Hey. Jim Franklin is originally from Galveston, raised in Lamarck, did stints in New York and San Francisco before settling in Austin. Jim knew early on that Austin would become a significant cultural center. In 1968, he began producing posters for the Vulcan Gas Company. Yeah. Yeah. Where along with uh, Gilbert Shelton and a rapidly growing list of artists, he would help set the foundations for the modern concert poster in Austin. While other Texas artists had toyed with the iconic image of the armadillo, it was Jim who laid claim to the nocturnal worm eater as a symbol of the Austin underground. And over here on this, this wall, we'll see uh, the, the, the first example of that in a flyer. Jim captured surrealism of Texas in his posters, and he offered a new take on psychedelia of the era. Rather than copy the styles of his West Coast colleagues, Jim's posters offered bizarre portraits, complex architectural figures, collages, and comic strip-like compositions. He designed the Armadillo World Headquarters logo, which graces the cover of our book and the venue's opening night poster. He took over the Ritz Theater in 1974, a move that helped establish Sixth Street 
as a destination for live music in Austin. He's produced album art <laughs> for bands such as Shiva's Headband, comic books, promotional material. He tour managed Freddie King, emceed at the Ritz and the Armadillo, and he continues to paint, perform, and provoke. <laughs> Jim Franklin. Ladies and gentlemen. Next up is, is Danny Garrett. Uh, Danny, born, born in Dodge City, Kansas, which he notes is a, a birthplace distinction that he shares with Dennis Hopper. But Danny grew up in Texas, and he arrived in Austin in 1970. Uh, upon his arrival, he, like many other artists and seekers of fortune, looked up Jim Franklin who helped him get some of his first uh, poster assignments. A self-trained artist, he quickly asserted himself on the poster scene, uh, creating posters for the Armadillo World Headquarters, Castle Creek, and the Austin Opera House under its various uh, names and guises. Uh, in 1976, he began producing posters for Antones, Austin's home of the blues. Clifford Antone re requested respectful portraits of the performers, and Danny obliged by providing exquisite uh, posters promoting all the blues greats who rolled into town. You'll see these over here. Uh, Muddy Waters, B.B. King, Albert King, John Lee Hooker, and so many others. Um, Danny's work combines surreal treatments of Texas iconography, nods to old bond certificate lettering, <laughs> subtle symbolism, obscure allusions, and sly riffs on album cover art. And no one can paint, uh, produce, a rams, ramshackle psychedelic stagecoach like Danny Garrett. <laughs> which, which you'll see on the, the back wall. Uh, Michael Priest describes Danny as a master of surface textures, and his boundless technical capacity lends itself to a variety of styles and approaches. He's designed posters and a bandana for Willie Nelson, as well as posters for a slew of performers from Asleep at the Wheel to Warren Zevon. He taught in Auckland, New Zealand for the better part of the last decade, but we're happy that he's returned to Texas and made his home in San Marcos. Danny Garrett. <laughs> Next we have Michael Priest hailing from the Michael Priest. Hailing from the suburbs of Fort Worth, he worked as a commercial artist during his summer vacations by the time he was 16. Bounced between UT and UT Arlington until 1972 when he became firmly entrenched in Austin's art and music scene. He would head Directions Company, which Nels Jacobson describes as Austin's first counterculture advertising agency and become a key figure in the Armadillo Art Squad, the loose collective of artists who would produce posters for the Armadillo. Um, later in the 1970s, he would help found Show Nuff Studios. Wherever one found poster artists congregating, working, and misbehaving, one found Michael <laughs> in their midst. His posters, <laughs> his posters combined the rigid qualities of commercial art with adventurous, hand-drawn designs. And Michael's critical assessment of Austin music poster art never fails to help explain the efforts of he and his colleagues. Whether he's commenting on the wanted man style portraits that were so common in Austin posters, explaining the shift in musical and visual styles that was initiated once the Ramones rolled into town in 1977, or lauding his colleagues like Dee White and Danny Garrett as brilliant colorists, Michael is never short on words regarding poster <laughs> art. And, and maybe he put it best when he described the desired effect of someone looking at an Austin music poster that they ripped off a wall or nicked from a record store. He told me in an interview, if we could make someone scream while they were laying down on the floor burning one, we felt like we had succeeded. <laughs> Michael Priest, ladies and gentlemen.
Before I introduce our moderator, Nels Jacobson, I, I must thank Nels for all of the support and encouragement and expertise that he has offered. I can only imagine what was going through his mind when I cold called him and began to tell him about this project. <laughs> but his response and his efforts have been nothing short of spectacular. And I also want to thank Joe Nick Potosky for all of the encouragement that he gave me. I had a... I had a phone conversation with Joe Nick in which he, he gave me encouraging words uh, as I began to embark on this project that I'll never forget. Um, Nels is a Chicago native who relocated to Austin in the late 70s. He began working as the promotional manager at Club Foot, one of Austin's uh, key venues of the early 80s, and he eventually began producing flyers and posters for the club. He also produced Club Foot's newsletter and calendar, Footprints, which provided all the news that was foot to print. After leaving Club Foot in 1983, uh, Nels founded Jagmo Studios, a design firm specializing in graphic art for the entertainment industry. During the next 10 years, he worked with numerous local performers, promoters, and clubs, and receiving the Austin uh, Chronicle Music Award for Best Poster, Best Concert Poster, five times. He's a prolific poster artist, and his work has advertised performances for everyone from Doug Somm to Rocky Erickson, Fela Kuti to Milton Nascimento and he has also produced notable anti-apartheid and anti-war posters. As original art director for South by Southwest, Nels designed the official logo and oversaw conference graphics from 1987 to 1992. He's written a number of articles on poster art, including a two-part definitive work on the Austin poster art scene titled The Maverick Tradition, Postering in Austin, Texas, and the wonderfully titled Armadillos, Peccadillos, and the Maverick Posterists of Austin, Texas. <laughs> Nels has practiced copyright, trademark, and entertainment law for 20 years and has written and lectured extensively on these topics. He contributed a brilliant essay for our book titled Colorful Tales and Early Techniques, Postering in Austin, an insightful history of the scene, and a masterful examination of poster art production. Nels Jacobson. Good afternoon. It's so good to see you all here. This is amazing. Boy, and on behalf of all of us up here and all the other artists in the room today, I want to just thank once again Katie uh, Salzman and also Lida Guz, who you haven't met but helped set this up, and another thanks to Alan Schaefer. They've been working on this for two years, and it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. So let's talk Austin posters. We've selected a variety of posters to look at today uh, from a number of Austin venues and a few from each of these artists. It isn't going to really be a free-ranging conversation necessarily, which is something that deserves to be had, but we don't have the time today. Uh, not for this forum. And Jim, Michael, Carrie, Danny, we're all here today, and I include myself, because we want to hear what you have to say. Uh, but because of the limited amount of time, I'm going to ask you, please be, <laughs> please be brief, maybe two or three minutes <laughs> per poster, if you could. I'm hoping to get through a dozen posters, uh, so let's jump right in. This, this first poster, as, as most of us know, is by Danny Garrett. By the way, it's on page 103. If you have your books, if, if somebody wants to follow along, I'll try, I'll try to remember uh, to let you know what page it's on. But I, obviously, you can see it up here. Um, this is a 1980 Antones poster. And the, your eye is inexorably drawn up to the, the center of that uh, wagon wheel. I love that. I think it's such a strong design. Um, and now, Danny, here's my question. Uh, we all know that Ray Benson's a pretty big guy. <laughs> Did you have any trouble fitting him in within the confines <laughs> of that poster? Well, actually, I did have a little bit of trouble fitting him in, which is why I've got him bending at the knees and crouching down. <laughs> he might have fit in the whole 11 by 17. 
uh, poster, but not within the margin. <coughs> so I do have him uh, bending down. And uh, also, this is a uh, good example of how we used to have to produce posters before uh, the digital revolution. We uh, generally uh, had, a, had two colors to work with, which was a base color, which was almost always black, and a spot color. In this case, it's uh, red. And um, we uh, usually did a pen and ink piece because they were cheapest and easiest to shoot. And then did a uh, acetate overlay for the color in which we had to cut away the uh, areas that uh, didn't take color and, and leave the acetate for areas that did. And that's how the wheel was created because I cut away the acetate there. And uh, this is also a good example of how uh, a lot of us uh, employed uh, the graphic with the lettering to make you know one solid statement and uh, here you can see um, Ray pointing to the uh, W on the wheel and uh, which uh, also yields the wagon wheel and uh, in this way I was able to marry the image of uh, Ray with the lettering and uh, uh, these kind of techniques I've learned from my colleagues up here and many of my colleagues out there. Because uh, I really didn't have any artistic training or, or study before I came to Austin. Uh, and uh, these guys were pretty much my art education, and uh, starting with Jim, who uh, introduced me to acetate overlays <laughs> right off the bat. Danny, Danny, thanks so much. The, I tell you, the, the lettering, I'm glad you brought that up, because that leads us that's a good segue to the very next poster that we wanted to look at. And um, here you've got one by Michael Priest, who is a fantastic uh, typographer uh, at lettering. And I've always liked this because it looks like Kinky's kind of pointing back the other way. You had Ray uh, uh, pointing one way, and, uh, and Kinky's just pointing back with his cigar the other way. Well, Kinky was. A wild man. <laughs> I, 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 imagine about five times as many of y'all as y'all are, all crammed in the same room, whipped into a frenzy on an assortment of preparations. <laughs> and uh, uh, I can't describe to you what a big deal uh, Kinky had become by the time we made this poster. I worked on the very first show that we know of here in the Texas Playboys playing at an unknown place called Lukenbach, Texas uh, in 1972. And uh, uh, he just had built momentum and built momentum and his friend Tom Paul Glazer helped him put out an album called Ride em, Jew Boy <laughs> that we discovered this incorrigible smartass was actually a very, very sensitive artist with a tremendous uh, poetic ability. And uh, it brought even more people uh, and a wider uh, range of audience. And the best thing, and to a great extent, it influenced the work of the Uranium Savages was that he satirized everyone equally. <laughs> and uh, you, you couldn't really call him a racist unless you called him a pan-racist because he took shots at everybody. And not, not the least of which was his own self. And his band, the uh, Texas Jew Boys, was made up with Glenn Fukunaga and, uh, uh, oh, who was the last asshole from El Paso? Uh, anyway, a, a wide ethnic variety, great musicians. Our, our friend Hank Ulrich, who took over uh, the Armadillo uh, wheel when uh, Eddie retired, actually played with uh, Kinky when they were in junior high. And uh, Kinky's dad brought him a big Revox four track tape recorder uh, down into the rumpus room below the living room said y'all are going to make some demo tapes and get the hell out of my house <laughs> and uh, sure enough they did and that 
that uh, four track Revox tape recorder was the basis of Onion Audio, Hank's recording studio inside the Armadillo World Headquarters that actually recorded a Emmy, uh, no, Grammy Award winning album, uh, a jazz album, which most people forget we did jazz, but we did some really great jazz, and we got to see some really great jazz. But on this particular night, uh, you'll notice he's got on his, fresh from a tiny western wear, his, his purple and white uh, chaps. The uh, security guys made a big hollow star of David with blue and white lights twined all around the, the to make the outline, and then another big pair of purple shafts with stars on them, but stars of David, uh, strung in there, and lassos, and at the break, they came out and made a presentation. They had elected Kinky as the Armadillo Security Sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> and they presented him with his uh, a tiara, and his uh, sash, and uh, he didn't know anything about this. So they came very close to outraging the guy that was used to be doing the outraging. And uh, it was just tremendous and fun. And uh, the other thing was he wouldn't get down until he got tired, and he could outlast most of us. He was very, very, uh, very, he liked that Peruvian marching powder. <laughs> <laughs> and he knew how to apply it. He knew how to apply it uh, uh, gingerly so he could increase duration. And uh, uh, it was great fun. And I'm hoping that we captured some of the roar. And I have to uh, take time out to remind everybody I couldn't have done this, and most of us couldn't have done any of it without, A, our photographers, in this case, Charlene Zlotnick. Charlene Zlotnick. Uh, I had the wonderful uh, job of interviewing potential photographers, uh, to see, and I could swap them getting into the show for uh, Print sheets, you know, what do you call those sheets? Context. Yes, contact sheets. Uh, so I could go through and find reference for uh, future uh, uh, promotional materials. And uh, we got great stuff that way and met great photographers. And their uh, outward limit was, it was no flash ever. And so people really had to concentrate on what they're doing. Fortunately, Burton Wilson was already there when I got there, and uh, he and I would always end up standing together at the back of the hall uh, because everybody else had sat down, and we might have to jump at any moment. And we had some incredible discussions of how you arrive at the telling moment that my, Michael, I've got to jump in here, and then yes. <laughs> I want to hear the rest of this. Yes. But we don't. We just don't have time. Okay, let's go and, to the next uh, one. And thanks so much. Uh, That's fine. <laughs> because we can't. Uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't get to the Vulcan, and this, of course, is a Jim Franklin poster. Yay. It's on. Uh, it's on page 52 in the, in the hymnal, uh, if you have it. Um, now, Jim, anyone familiar with even a fraction of your body of work would know that you bring an interesting perspective to the table. In this case, how did you happen to draw Charlie Pritchard upside down? Well, it was a, a, a working process that I had used uh, when I was a, a teenager, uh, you turn a painting over to check whether everything is balancing and whether it weighs. You check the the elements of the uh, of the uh, of the composition that way. And looking in a mirror is another good way to get a fresh view. 
sometimes leaving the room and coming back is, gives you another view. And in this case, I, I began applying uh, the, uh, the, the flip side, the flip version, because uh, I was able to get two weeks of uh, information on one poster. Uh, you uh, have one week with Mance Lipscomb, the next week was uh, the Conqueroo, Charlie Pritchard being the, the lead guitar player of the Conqueroo. Uh, Charlie was known as Fat Charlie, uh, and it's primarily because his hair was fat. Uh, and Gilbert Shelton had um, learned this technique of split fountain. Um, I think he learned it from uh, uh, Johnny Mercer, who was our printer. And uh, you would ink the, the roller with two different co color or three different colors of ink, and they would blend together as it's inking the, uh, the plate. And uh, so that was a way of getting multiple colors with just one or two runs. And uh, when it came to my uh, opportunity to use this, I, I wanted to use one of my black and white, I, I've always favored black and white, I love Franz Klein. Franz Klein was the abstract artist who showed me how to understand non-objective abstract painting. And uh, so this, uh, but I wanted to use the, the split fountain as well, so by inking the, uh, the second color, the second run uh, with the, uh, the two colors of, of green and, or is it purple and green, I was able to create the, the uh, uh, image of gas passing through. You know, it, was a, <laughs> you know, it was the Vulcan Gas Company, by the way. And, uh, um, and you can also turn it horizontally and it reads as well, and, and the lettering also spirals around the Vulcan Gas Company logo, so you can just go all the way around with it. Uh, I did a follow-up version to, uh, with Shiva's headband and Lightning Hopkins. And the Lightning Hopkins half was a, a hot plate because the old blues players weren't allowed to eat in restaurants. And uh, they had to have a hot plate to cook their own food. So that symbolized uh, um, Lightning Hopkins. And then I had the whole band of Shiva's headband on the, the other half of the poster. You flip that up as well. Um, I was lucky enough to be um, written up in the Daily Texan by uh, a, a journalist student uh, who was also repairing the air conditioners at the Vulcan, Don, <laughs> Don Trepanier. And he wanted to do an article about me, and uh, I wanted to use this technique of, of showing work upside down in different positions. So it was probably the only time the, the Daily Texan ran a, um, an article with four different photos all pointing a different direction <laughs> to encourage you to turn things around. Uh, because you know, when a book's on the table, it's upside down. When you're, you're, we're used to looking at things upside down, so I, I make use of that in my uh, in my abstract paintings as well. It's just a, a way of, uh, of getting a flip view of things. You know? Man, man, that, that's wild. That's wild. Let's bring Carrie in, real quickly here. Where is it, Carrie? Okay. Hit it, Carrie. Good one, Jim. <laughs> Yeah, because we want to get Carrie into the conversation, too. Uh, Willie Nelson, Doug Somm, Alvin Crow. Uh, you've got a lot going on in this poster, which is kind of typical of your, your work. Um, what, and this is on page 94. Again, if anybody's following along, this poster's from 1975, Austin Municipal Auditorium. Uh, Carrie, what goes into incorporating so many disparate elements into a, a cohesive whole, which is something you do very well and often. What? Bill <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sounds so smart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, okay, I'll tell you, this was basically uh, Silk Creek Saloon, who I worked for for a number of years. Thank God. Yeah. Like my only job, once a month I had a poster. <laughs> But you could live on $50 in those days. But <laughs> this was uh, Soap Creek Saloon. Uh, Carlin Major and George Majeski decided to have a concert away from Soap Creek. And this was Willie Nelson, who was pretty big at the time. And, and Doug was, you know, Doug. And, <laughs> and Alvin was Alvin. And I think maybe, I don't know, this might have been pretty soon after Willie came back to town. I don't really know, to tell you the truth. But it, it seemed like it was kind of like a big deal when it happened. And it was a big deal. So they wanted me to draw a poster, but they made sure 
that was legible. <laughs> <laughs> Because I have a problem with lettering. A lot of us do. So that's why those are like press on letters. <laughs> like read it if you're driving down the drag at 35 miles an hour. Right. And me, I had to always, you know, mess with it. And I put Mr. Willie Nelson on. I put Mr. on there to make it look more like, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> I always mess stuff up. I like, it looks fine. So I put that on there. And then the, the down here, the sheriff part, that's uh, Sheriff Frank. Remember Raymond Frank? Yeah. yeah. The sheriff that shoots shoot straight. <laughs> And of course, everybody said the sheriff that shoots straights. <laughs> because he was kind of a liberal, you know, kind of a guy. And he was the actual the sheriff. Back at Soap Creek, there was no Austin Police Department. They wouldn't come out there. BK Police Department, I don't think they even had one. So it was up to the sheriffs. And the sheriff was Raymond Frank. <laughs> And he was already paid off by George Majeski. <laughs> <laughs> Don't come out here. We're not going to mess things up. So basically, this was like they want everything to be legible, and it was kind of a job for them. And uh, once again, Michael mentioned this. We photographers, and the photographers are mentioned on here. Uh, both photographers' names are right there. Norm. So I can't read it. Carol, maybe Sammy Mack knows them, but. Anyway, that uh, is why those are there. They're like just photographs. I just, you know, copied them immediately and uh, put those press-on letters on there and just got the thing to the printer overnight, which was usually the case. So uh, that's, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> and let's, let's stick with you for another one. This is a, a landmark first Soap Creek Saloon calendar you ever produced, February 1974, uh, page 92. And uh, this thing is, is amazing to me, especially that at the bottom of it, and you, you can't see it on the screen up here, and maybe you can see it in the book, I don't know, you wrote number one in a series, collect them all. <laughs> that was, that's brilliant. <laughs> Basically, I was, you know, asking for job security. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really know if there was going to be enough. This was like two weeks. As you can notice, like the first calendar, you know, George Majeski uh, had me do. I did some uh, other stuff for him, like uh, menus and things. And then uh, finally, they let me just do this poster. And this was, as you see, that you know that photograph is Freddie. You know it is. That's Sam Andrews. It's basically who that. Just, I just took that, once again, you know, me, I just copy whatever I can see laying around. It was like Rolling Stone had a picture of Sam Andrews. Oh, that looks like some kind of hippie dude, so I'll put him on there. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to try to disguise it so people didn't know I just ripped him off immediately. I put that little circle thing right there in the middle, like, oh, no one will notice. <laughs> But it was the first one, and Greasy Wheels is all over, and Lissa is right here. Yeah. Greasy Wheels. <laughs> this was the first, and uh, this was printed on paper. The paper this was printed on was like nor not normal paper. For some reason, it was just kind of like this weird paper that was probably cheaper. And George Majeski was trying to cut corners, of course. <laughs> and so they only printed like 300 copies of this particular poster. I remember it was just like, you know, one time only deal, 300 copies almost on paper. So any of these actually survived all these years is miraculous. Yeah. Because I went on to draw these for 12 years. I had like a job every month. I had a job to draw these posters. And that was what kept me alive during the 70s and 80s in Austin, Texas. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for us. Yeah, I, I, I love that calendar, and so many of them. Uh, uh, let's jump back to Jim. And uh, so this is, this is on page 125. It's uh, obviously for the Armadillo World Headquarters. And uh, Jim, you've been quoted as saying that Texas is a surrealist state. 
And so much of your work uh, might be characterized as having a surrealist edge. Uh, so what was your inspiration for this memorable Springsteen poster? Well, I was, um, I was really honored also to notice that most of my uh, responses to my artwork and my posters was the word weird. <laughs> In San Francisco, they were saying, oh, that's psychedelic. And here they were saying, that's weird. <laughs> and that was my intention. When I was learning to draw as a child, I, I, I wanted to get away from the question of what is it you're drawing? So I, I learned to draw very clearly what it is I'm drawing. And then I realized I could go to another level and get them to ask, why are you drawing it? <laughs> so that's where surrealism comes in. It makes you think on a different level than you think you're thinking on. And uh, this, this particular image uh, for Bruce Springsteen was involved the, the hearing and, and uh, sp singing and hearing uh, uh, capabilities. They, the, uh, the, there's a lip inside the ear smoke, uh, speaking to or singing to a microphone which is uh, coming out of another ear and the, the, uh, the guitar is coming out of the ear with a, a hammer coming out of that. Uh, it's just tr trying to make statements about um, the audio experience of rock and roll uh, without being, uh, you know, just being too, uh, uh, too much like a glamour magazine or something. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's kind of what uh, that was about. And Bruce Springsteen was, uh, I was honored to be able to do this poster for his first, uh, per, uh, uh, I think it was his first appearance in Austin. And he, he told uh, the staff that uh, if this gig had gone like it do had do done on the rest of the tour where they were booing him because he was not the new Bob Dylan, uh, that he was going to go back to New Jersey. And I came, had the, the fortune of uh, being the MC for the show, and I came out with my armadillo flag, my tech deer antlers, and armadillo shell, uh, my high priest outfit. And, uh, and that was a signal to the audience to go crazy. So when, when I introduced uh, Bruce, the audience, it was like he was coming out for an encore, and he hadn't even warmed anyone up yet. And uh, he told, told us afterwards that, that's what made him stay on the stay on the road. And every time he'd come back to Austin, he would he would call out our names when he played the bigger venues. Is Franklin or any of those guys from the Armadillo here? And in fact, I was honored last year when he he, he mentioned my name in the keynote uh, address for the South by Southwest. And um, so Bruce Springsteen is a loyal and and, and true person and yeah. justified. Sure is. Man, thanks for, thanks for that, Jim. I've always wondered what, what you were driving at uh, specifically <laughs> there, well, as I so it, often do. It made you wonder. <laughs> That's the whole point. You know, you, I always wanted to see a, a, a special element added to, uh, to chewing gum that one more chew and you get a whole burst of new flavor. Because once that, once that flavor's gone, you put that gum out of your mouth. It becomes a chore to chew. And art, if you can put something, a surprise in there, then it makes you look twice or three times. Well, here's a, here's a poster now by Danny that it's obvious what you get. It's, it's just a, uh, a beautiful portrait, an elegant design. Uh, it may be one of your most uh, famous or recognizable posters ever. And you said uh, that Clifford insisted that the posters be respectful of the musical artists. Yes, that was uh, <clears throat> that was just one caveat that uh, these blues uh, musicians be treated with respect on every level, and of course that spilled over into promotional posters as well. So I tried to do a very respectful image of Muddy here. Um, he's sort of Buddha-like, but uh, this is one of uh, two uh, posters that I did for Muddy Waters for Antones. This is called Bust of Muddy, and then the other one is Dancing Muddy. And uh, it's, uh, it, it was a real pleasure and a privilege to work for Clifford and to, uh, to picture the blues a bit. And uh, uh, I sure miss the guy and uh, all that he's done for, uh, for music in Austin and especially for the blues. 
this is another example that, uh, of the same thing that Jim was referring to as a split fount um, image. This was a two-color piece, once again, with uh, black and white being the base art and then another color overlay. Only in this case, um, the, uh, the ink tray was uh, uh, placed alongside the vertical with uh, yellow at the top and red at the bottom, and then it blended in the middle with orange. So in this way, we could get more than one color. In this case, not just red, not just yellow, not just orange, but all three by using the split fount technique. Um, I also incorporated for the first time a uh, playing card motif, which uh, I followed up in many subsequent uh, Antone's posters. And um, uh, the, the blues is just sort of connected with uh, playing cards or drinking or any kind of carousing. And, it's uh, um, so I wanted to create a sort of uh, iconic graphic um, to connect all the posters together, and in this case, this was the very first one that I did. And of course, I've got an an ace of spades here. Uh, at the time, Buddy was still alive, but uh, I uh, arranged the playing card motif such that uh, the aces were uh, uh, musicians that had gone had already passed away. The Kings were uh, musicians that were at the top of, of their game. The uh, Jacks were the up-and-coming musicians, and the uh, Queens were, of course, the women musicians. Now, uh, nobody wanted to be a deuce or a five or a seven. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, generally speaking, those were left out of the portraiture. But when I did the uh, anniversary posters, I would incorporate those numbers to uh, indicate what uh, anniversary it is. For instance, I used a pair of eights for the 16th anniversary, which featured Willie Dixon. And uh, so anyway, this is uh, sort of the uh, graphic language that was evolving relative to the uh, Antones posters. Cool. This, uh, Michael, Michael, this uh, uh, new writer's design uh, for the Dillo is certainly uh, one of your most well-known pieces. And you've created so many illustrations and posters over the years. When you finished this, did you know it was something special? Did you, did you have a feeling about it? Well, there, it's almost impossible for me to look at uh, any of my stuff without seeing all the mistakes. <laughs> and this one uh, kind of just rolled out in front of me, and when I was finished with it, I still liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's also, I need to make a, a brief note here. In San Francisco, the weather's always real nice. People could afford to stand around for a half hour, 45 minutes on the street trying to figure out what a poster said. <laughs> in, in, in Austin, if you couldn't read it from a passing car uh, with a 44-ounce cherry limeade between your legs and the wing vent open, then it didn't work as advertising. And uh, especially Carrie and I were constantly accused of filling up all the white space, <laughs> which we certainly did. Uh, and, and one of the reasons was we uh, came to expect people to steal the posters and take them home and stick them on the wall in the living room. Well, there needed to be something for them to find that they hadn't found before when they did that so that it would continue to be uh, 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 stimulating in some way. And this also happens to be a portrait of my horse that I had in high school. Her name was Nugget. She'd never been shod. Her feet were about this big. And uh, th this is a, uh, a Sunday morning headed home after a really good Saturday night. <laughs> and they decided to take a break leaned up against the, we don't have sororals in Texas, but uh, they may have wandered a little far afield. <laughs> and uh, he's got a hand rolled 
cigarette of some sort, <laughs> and so does the horse. <laughs> Letters. These letters were on a New Riders t-shirt, and the only picture I had of it, it was a very tight t-shirt on a very busty young woman. And so I had to straighten out the letters enough that they could be read from a passing vehicle. And it worked much better than I thought it might. Everything just kind of fell together. And uh, when that happens, you're done before you're ready to be. You know, I, I was really enjoying that. And oops, it's over with. Well, so, it, Michael, let me interrupt for a second sorry. to go to another, another one of your posters. Oh. Oh. Uh, the Grateful Dead at, at Maynard Downs. This is on page 127, if anybody's following along. And what was your thinking when you created this poster? It's a bit of a different look I was than the one we saw prior to this. Exhausted. I just spent a day and a night drawing a poster, and then the next night and part of the day with Benny Benford at the print shop, uh, uh, doping the uh, negatives to uh, print that poster, and just as I finished, before I could stand up from the light table, Sam Cutler, the manager of Maynard Downs, who also brought you the uh, uh, Brian Jones uh, Memorial when he uh, passed away in London, and I'm afraid the man that brought you Altamont, but without whose leadership the Angels wouldn't have been hired to state security and Mick Jagger would have been shot and killed. It took a, a movie to prove that it was the case and by that time Sam had been run off. But anyway, crazy Englishman, lots of fun, absolutely no concept of, of uh, limits. And he says, okay, we got it. And I said, okay, what do we got? And he says, we've got the Grateful Dead booked at Mater Downs with a rodeo. <laughs> We're gonna do a Grateful Dead rodeo. And I went, well, hell yeah. <laughs> of course we are. Now, I don't think the record had come out yet, but the promotion for the record with the Cyclops skull, and I think it's a, it's a mouse uh, design, had just come out and the uh, Lettering was only horizontal strokes, so I had to add some vertical strokes to make it legible from a passing pickup. <laughs> and uh, uh, then I decided, well, we're going to have a rodeo. We better put a bull rider hat on the Cyclops skull. And being that it's Texas, we need some yellow roses. And then uh, it just didn't balance yet. So it occurred to me maybe eagle feathers would do it because when we put cowboys, we like to put Indians too. I mean, you know, uh, th this late on, we've all got some of both. And, uh, and I don't know if you can squint down enough to see the brand at the bottom there. And I don't know if you can read brands, um, but they just opened the bar at Manor Downs and the brand says, two, lazy two, P bar, <laughs> which was the name of the new bar at Mayor Downs. So me, me and Sam became real good friends and laughed our butts off through the entire thing. And uh, uh, the show went great. We had six time world champion all around cowboy Larry Mahan buck out on a live buffalo while the Grateful Dead played the national anthem <laughs> at the beginning of the show. <laughs> just quickly, unfortunately, 
Buffalo see a lot farther than cows do. And the show, the concert was behind us in the paddock, but the, in the arena was just Larry and the buffalo. And when they opened the gate for the buffalo to buck out, he saw the open gate at the other side of the compound and he just ran on a beeline <laughs> straight over there. And so Larry is just giving it this. <laughs> and nobody's believing it, but it doesn't matter. But we didn't do a rehearsal because we wanted all the juice to be in that one moment. And luckily Larry was a sport. And uh, uh, the guy that owned the uh, uh, buffalo was just horribly embarrassed. And I said, there's no way you can train a buffalo to buck. <laughs> We're just glad we got through that part, and by the and then it was a Grateful Dead show, so, so there was plenty of everything for everybody. Oh man! <laughs> and, and they came back and did it three more times <laughs> in the next five years. Jeez. Well, here's here's another poster by Carrie. And this is fairly bursting at the seams <laughs> with imagery and information here. And history. Uh, Carrie, you may pack more, or as much anyway, into any uh, one piece as any artist I've ever seen. <laughs> now, as I understand it, this was the first performance of the group that was or would become the Uranium Savages. Uh, uh, please tell us a little bit about, about that. Well. <laughs> Mr. Franklin right here started the Ritz Theater in 1974. Uh, it was an abandoned porno theater on 6th Street. And Jim saw the potential. <laughs> <laughs> and if you recall, in 1974, most of us probably would not be on 6th Street. When I say most of us, I mean white people. Most of us would not be there on 1974 on 6th Street, am I correct? It was uh, Chicano exactly. bars, uh, you know, just black transvestites. Skid Row is what you Skid Row is the word I'm... And <laughs> <laughs> it still is, some say, but it was not, there was no fraternity people unless there were frat guys going down there looking for, you know, hookers, <laughs> which were basically guys dressed up as women. But anyway, <laughs> they didn't know that. That's another story. But anyway, the Ritz Theater was there, and Jim had the theater, and I was working there, which basically meant I helped kind of start it and help whatever it took, you know, clean up and work the popcorn, whatever. And uh, we said, can we play here one night? And he goes, well, okay, we'll give you a Thursday. That's nothing's happening. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, had, we were the Uranium Savages, and there was also another band called the Marsh Mongrels, which were the guys, well, Herman Bennett is here, actually, who was in the Marsh Mongrels. And uh, that, was all, that was the plumbers, basically, at the Ritz, with the plumbers, with the Marsh Mongrels. Yeah. Yes, and I think the Savages were the pot dealers. <laughs> so we're going to do a battle of the bands. <laughs> and uh, that's why there's so much stuff on here because we thought we're going to just throw the whole kitchen sink at them and just do everything, and we still do it to this day. But it has the movie, and Eagle Pinnell was going to do the movie. Remember Eagle Pinnell? Yeah. yeah. Uh, whole shoot match. He's going to show a movie. We're going to have a battle of the bands. We're going to have a, we had a bartender on stage. We had like 15 electric guitars. We just did everything we possibly could to actually have a show because the, the, whoever won the battle of the bands have to go on to play New Year's Eve with Ramon, Ramon, and Four Daddios at the Ritz Theater on New Year's Eve. Exactly. And that was a big deal. Yeah, it was a mighty big deal. That was deal. like being on The Voice or something in those days. <laughs> <laughs> so we, our plan with the Savages, and once again, if I would have known this poacher was going to be in a museum 40 years later, I would have spent some time on this stuff. <laughs> I mean, exactly. It's like no one's paying to do this stuff. And uh, that was the inside of the Rich Theater. It's going to be like a battle zone. And uh, that was the Marsh Mongrels coming out of the, out of the uh, they were actually from the Golden Triangle area. They're coming out of Port Arthur, Beaumont. And there's the savages. So we had just all that stuff on there. And there's a quote on there, Mr. Franklin, that says, 
is it going to be any good? <laughs> we said, we don't know, but we're going to get people in here. So we, basically, it was just a bunch of PR, making like something's going to happen, and then people come and show up, you know? And that's, that's how it all started. And we did win the Battle of the Bands. And the reason how we won, because the Marshmongers were a real band. They had like real musicians. <laughs> but the reason we won is because we said we'll go up first. That was our strategy. So we went up first and just did, threw everything at them. You know, we had dancing girls, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> 50 people on stage. And uh, then the Marshmallows came on, they were a four piece blues band. <laughs> and then we pulled the plugs on their electricity. <laughs> we were cheaters. <laughs> we were liars. We were on drugs. We didn't know better. <laughs> and they were also winners. <laughs> and we won. And a footnote is. Kind of our claim to fame in that particular night was the Marsh Mongrels bass player was Clifford Anton. That's true. That's true. That's true. And, and he lost and went on to open up Anton's. Right. And we won and we got that gig on New Year's Eve and we did so well, so Creek Saloon hired us and the rest is history. Absolute <laughs> history. Thank you. Well, uh, uh, from the Ritz, from the Ritz and Antones and Soap Creek Saloon, let's go to the Austrian Opry House. Uh, Danny Garrett, a classic image he created. This was in 1978. It's on page 90. And um, Danny, please tell us a little bit about this, and including in particular, uh, uh, tell us about the distinctive way Willie has knotted his tie. Oh. Oh, yeah. um, I've gotten a, a lot of mileage out of uh, James Montgomery Flagg's uh, uh, recruiting poster from World War I, the Uncle Sam, I Want You. Uh, I did one of, uh, I think, Orangeburger in this position when, uh, for Spamorama, and uh, this is one of two I actually did for Willie. Uh, this was a time when the, uh, this particular uh, a uh, picnic was held at uh, the Austin Opry House, and it was still the Austin Opry House, yeah. and not the Austin Opera House, which it later became. And they kind of inherited this from the first bunch that ran the place, which was, which was called the Texas Opry House. So they kind of kept this, and, uh, and this is the one I did on very short notice. It says for the sixth and seventh uh, picnics, but it was only for the sixth. And um, I actually did the seventh uh, you know, with the help of my colleague Guy Juke, uh, which was <laughs> and it was a full-blown, full-color poster. And um, but this one was another. Um, well, this was an actual three-color. You'll see uh, two colors in additional in addition to black here, which is the red and the blue. It was usually either two-color, one-color, or four-color. This was an actual. Uh, three color, which is very rare. Anyway, this uh, particular one that I did, I, I uh, depicted Willie as uh, Uncle Sam, and I put an, an Antone's card in his hat for no good reason. It's just, it's just in there and backwards. But uh, the knot and the tie that um, Nels was talking about, if you look closely, is in the shape of Texas. Oh, yeah. And uh, this is what I like to that call an been. Easter egg which is something that's hidden in the image that you only come stumble across when you examine it closely. And of course, this is not unique with me. Most of my colleagues have done the same thing. And um, I think we really tried to create uh, interesting images where uh, you really had to uh, participate in the viewing to understand everything. Interactive. Yes, interactive. Before there was such a term. That's right. And, uh, and speaking of interesting images, uh, here's another Jim Franklin piece. This is from 1971. It's a Dillo poster, obviously, advertising two dates, two dis different dates, one uh, for Taj Mahal, one for Lightning Hopkins. And it's another uh, example of Jim's unique vision. Um, please tell us about it. 
Jim. And now, does something like this come to you in an instant, or is this, do you kick around a few ideas and then you piece it together? Well, the Taj Mahal is, I have a, 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 a passion for domed and arched and vaulted architecture. And uh, this was um, an opportunity to show the architecture of the armadillo in relation to a very famous piece of actual architecture. And, uh, and of course, the lightning uh, strike uh, is what transforms the, the dome of the uh, Taj Mahal into an armadillo. Uh, electricity does uh, strange things to objects. And uh, in this case, it was um, uh, making the, the Indian, uh, we also had a, a salute to my, one of my musical forms that I've uh, always favored, which was uh, Indian classical music, Ravi Shankar and such. And uh, so this was a way of just uh, paying a tribute to a, a, a great piece of uh, architecture. Uh, and I remember when uh, Taj Mahal came into the building, uh, we, we um, sat around talking to him and I, I asked him uh, how, he, how he came to use the, the name Taj Mahal and he said, because it keeps me oriented towards the east. <laughs> that's, that's very good. <laughs> so, there you go. And Lightning Hopkins, of course, uh, needs no explanation. He's just the uh, source of electric, electric music in Texas. Uh, people don't realize how important Lightning was. Uh, so it was my honor to be able to do a couple of posters with where he was performing. First time Lightning played the Vulcan Gas Company, uh, uh, he started into his, one of his great songs, and unfortunately his drummer and bass player, including Lightning, had been drinking uh, quite a bit before going on, and Lightning actually had to stop the song and start it over again. Oh, oh she and, it was, and they did that, that happened the whole, through the whole set. The next night, they were sober, dressed, and it was a polished show. <laughs> so sometimes moments instruct better than any kind of teacher could ever do. Man, yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, Katie, I think, yeah, I think we may have reached our limit. Right? And uh, yeah. so thanks so much. Thanks so much to each one of these artists. They've, uh, they've